Amen. Well, I invite you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Haggai chapter 1, Haggai chapter 1, and in your guidebook to page 38. Go ahead and turn in your Our Time guidebook to page 38, where you can take some notes. Uh, Haggai chapter 1 and page 38 in your guidebook here. Um, Haggai is the second shortest book of the Old Testament. It's just two chapters long. Don't you love it when you can read a whole book of the Bible in two chapters? Um, you just go home, read the whole book. You'll be, you'll be like, whoa. Haggai, chapter 2. A little bit of context of Haggai. Um, Haggai was a prophet of God speaking to the people of God when they had um, come back from captivity from Babylon. So Babylon invaded Israel three different times. And here, a a remnant, a portion of people, were allowed to return to Israel. They had returned to Israel with a heart for God. But like you and I can relate to so easily, their hearts had drifted away from prioritizing God, from prioritizing God's ministry. I'm titling the sermon this morning, It's Our Time to Prioritize. And I think you'll see why as we dig into Haggai uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. So would you follow along with me as I just dig in? And um, we'll, uh, we've will we got three considerations that we'll look at in this text together. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not come. The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruin? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew. The earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on 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 what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray, speak to us through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, I noted that um, Israel's situation is very different and very similar to real-life situation. It's very different in that um, God was instructing Israel to rebuild the temple. We're not building the temple. Uh, We're building a a building, a place of ministry, but what we understand is that we, God's people, have become his temple. It's it's mind-blowingly wondrous that when we turned from our sin and turned to Jesus, God filled us with his spirit. So so the temple is is where God's presence resided. Now God's presence resides in us. We have become the temple of God. So what we're doing at Real Life is not building the temple. God has built his temple in us, and he's filled his temple with his spirit, and it's just unspeakably wonderful that we've become the temple of God. So it's very different, but it's also very similar. It's very similar in that the temple was the place of worship and ministry. It was the, the hub of where Israel would gather and, and, and sacrifices would be, would be made. And what we are building in our building is going to be a hub of discipleship. It's going to be a place of worship. It's going to be where we, all the temples of the Holy Spirit, gather together. It's going to be where the temple of God gathers collectively for worship. 
So what we've got before us and in front of us, it, it's different, but it's very similar to what God's people had in front of them. I just want to look at three quick considerations with you, and the first is just simply this. God's people failed to prioritize the rebuilding of the temple. That's why Haggai came. That's what he, he came with a, a prophetic message that, that they had failed to prioritize the rebuilding of the temple. Look in verses 1 through 4 with me. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Let me just pause there, and some of you are like, like, why does it matter when this happens? <laughs> it matters when it happened because it was a really big deal to the Lord. It was like, this was a really big deal. And he's like, here's when this took place. Look at verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Why did they think that the time had not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord? I mean, I wonder if like inflation, you know, like is that whether it's a terrible time to rebuild the house of the Lord, you know, or, you know, was it a bad season, you know, it's the rainy season, you know, it's, it's hard to build when it's rainy, you know. Listen, the reason God's people said it's not time to rebuild the house of the Lord is simple. It wasn't their priority. That's why. It wasn't their priority. Verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, or rather verse 3, then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruin? What, what had they prioritized? They prioritized their own house. They're like, we're going to dress up our house, and we're going to put panels on the wall. While God's temple lies in ruin, we're going to focus on our house. And, and God speaks to Haggai, and he says, is it time for you to dress up your house while my house lies in ruins? I think we all can relate to this because it's so easy, isn't it, for our priority for God in his ministry, in his church, the bride of Christ, to shift to so many other things. I mean, maybe this morning, it, maybe, maybe for some of you, you would say, my house is like the biggest competitor with like my passion for the Lord. Others might say it's, it's my entertainment. Others might say it's my vacation. I mean, you just fill in the blank. There's all kinds of things that compete with, with priority. It's really interesting, the word priority entered into the English language in about the 1400s. And when it entered into the English language, it entered into the ling English language as a singular term, priority. And it wasn't until the 1900s, over 500 years later, that the, the term priority actually began to be used in the plural, priorities. It's interesting, isn't it, that we feel like we can bend reality by having multiple priorities? For 500 years, people understood it, priority is singular because the essence of what priority is is that it's first. It comes before everything else. So you can't have multiple priorities, though we like to deceive ourselves in thinking that we've got priorities. No, we have a priority, singular, one priority. Regardless of our, you know, chosen use of the word, the essence of the word priority is what's first. And there's only one thing that can be first. And God was saying to his people at this time, you've chosen to make your house first, not my house first. Um, you know, uh, when we think about priority, we think about what gets attention, what gets focus, what gets funding. And when I think about our church, and when I think about how we've prioritized, I just get so excited. God, th this situation in Haggai's day, he was speaking to God's people about their failure to prioritize. But church, like, I want to celebrate you today because collectively, I think we've done a really amazing job of prioritizing God's ministry. I remember our first Christmas together as a church, we asked everybody in the church to bring a gift card um, to give the custodian at Carmel Elementary School. Now, why were we doing that? Well, it's because the custodian got there before everybody else got there, unlocked the building, and he stayed until our whole morning was done, and he would lock the building. The custodian actually had to agree to have extra work hours for our church to meet in the building. So, like, like he was a hero, you know, like, you know, Jesus is the hero, and then it was our custodian because he was there every Sunday before and after. 
So what we did is um, we, had a, we, we, had, we invited everybody to bring a gift card or a cash gift, and we had a couple people stand down in the front with stockings. And in, in, in our worship service, people would, we, we lined up, and everybody, everybody dropped their gift card or their card in the stocking. And we didn't put him on the spot, and we didn't bring him up front, you know, but we gave him a stockpile of gift cards and of money, and it had to be at least like $6,000, just bless the custodian. Um, for Christmas, and the week after that, I asked him, um, I said, hey, what was your favorite gift card? And he said, oh, I hadn't looked at him yet. You know, I was like, yeah, whatever, you looked at him, you know. But it was such a sweet time in the life of our church because we were like a baby as a church. We were like an infant, and it was our first time to step into something together and all of us say we're all going to give to the custodian. It was beautiful. The next, the next moment in our church where I saw the generosity of our church flourish um, was in the chairs that you're sitting in today. When our church started, we were sitting in these metal hardback chairs, you know, that got really annoying when the preacher went long, you know. Some of you almost didn't come in today because you're like, they were coming out when you were coming in. You're like, how long is he preaching today? It's not that long, I assure you. We started the service late. Anyways, we used to have these metal chairs. And these chairs that we're sitting in are expensive. To to buy all these chairs was like $20,000. I know. You're like, maybe we should go back to the metal chairs. Well, you know. And we put it before our church and we said, hey, we have a goal, $20,000 to have these chairs so that we could welcome more people in to the worship service. We surpassed that goal, and it was a sweet celebration. And again, this is when we were like a baby as a church. Like we were just getting going. It was a beautiful, beautiful time. Uh, Many of you know what came next. What came next is we found land. It's an amazing story. And we bought land, and we lacked $70,000 from paying off the land when we closed on the land. So we brought that before the church, and the church in two weeks Paid off the 70000 It was so awesome. I was standing right, right down here over in the Madison room where they have that, that duck pin bowling over there now. That's where we used to worship. And I was standing right here, and this guy walks down the aisle after the service. I never, I never laid eyes on the guy in my life. And he, he, he stuck a, a check in my pocket. It was $40,000. I was like, oh, my goodness. So then we got to tell this story, and other people were like, well, we're, I'm giving $5,000, I'm giving this. And that. So that happened like first service, we told the story in the second service, and at the end of the second service, I got a text from somebody saying, we're covering the full amount on whatever's lacking. And I'm like, you don't even know what's lacking. And they said, we're covering it, we don't care. Our church prioritized the work of God, the mission of God, and it was amazing. So as I think about what's going on in Haggai's day, Haggai was bringing a a, a prophetic message. Um, But today, as I think about our church collectively, I bring a celebration of look at how you've given. Look at one of my favorite things to do (laughs) is to look at your your giving church in the worship program. Do you have a worship program? Do you see this? Thank you. You look... In the month of February, and in the month of February, we budgeted $97,000. But in the month of February, you gave $117,000. Church, way to go, prioritizing the mission of God and the work of God and the, the bride of Christ. I'm so proud of you, and it's such a privilege to serve as your pastor. I get a sense that we have prioritized the work of God. But here's what I don't know. Here's what I don't know. I get a sense of what we've done collectively as a church, but what I don't know is how you individually have given. What I don't know is if you individually have prioritized the mission of God and the work of God in the church. And, and that's what this is, that's what this, over the next several weeks, that's what this is about. It's about us individually engaging in our relationship with the Lord. Check this out. If somebody came in this morning, and they said, you got a $5 million goal? I'm going to write you a check for $5 million. We would continue to do this series. We would continue to move through our time. Because what this is really about is our individual relationships with the Lord and how we're responding to him and how we individually are investing in his mission. So, yes, we have a goal of $5 million, but God has a goal of making us generous people. God has a goal of shaping and molding us into the image of Jesus. God has a goal of making us sacrificial people that trust him and that prioritize his work. 
Have you ever heard that phrase, failure to launch? I, somebody told me the other day there's a movie. I haven't seen the movie. Maybe I need to see the movie. But when, when we were starting the church, there was a girl that kept referring to her brother as a failure to launch. And essentially what, she, you know, essentially what had happened was mom and dad had, like, given everything they got to get him through high school, right? It's like all the late nights and all the blood, sweat, and tears, and here comes graduation day, and glory, hallelujah, we're dreaming of him doing something great in the world, and off he goes to college, and all the sacrifices that they made to get him through college, you know, with this great dream and passion that something awesome is going to happen in his life, you know, and then what happens is he graduates from college, and he moves back in with mom and dad, and here comes his 27th birthday, and here comes his 31st birthday, and he's passing that level of Zelda or, you know, that's what we played back in the day. You know, he's like mastering the video game in the basement. Our culture calls that a failure to launch. So as a church, it's important that we understand if you don't lean in and if I don't lean in and if we don't step into into a, a, a place of maturity, we as a church could be a failure to launch. In other words, like every good mom, like you know, when, when he's rounding his 30th birthday and playing the video games, every good mom's going to say, you got to be out on this date, right? It's like, you got to get out of here. You got to grow up. You got to mature. You got to step into your own, right? Well, our landlord here has given us a date and says, hey, your church has grown. Your church has matured. You're, you got a date. You got you to move on. You got to step out. It's, it's our time to mature. It's, it's our time to prioritize the work of the Lord, and we can't be a failure to launch. Um, what we see is that when God's people failed to prioritize the rebuilding of the temple, God disciplined his people for their wrong priority. Look at verses 5 and 6 with me. Now therefore, now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts. Now what is that phrase, Lord of hosts? That's a curious phrase, isn't it? It's used in the Bible over 200 times. The, word, the phrase Lord of hosts, the, the phrase host there is a military term. And what it means is, is that God is leading an army of angels. That's what it's talking about. The Lord of hosts surrounding him is this host of angels, and the Lord is leading an army of angels. That's the way the Lord is referred to here. Look at verse 5. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. The the Lord is is telling them, man, you're working so hard to get ahead, but you just can't get ahead. Indeed, when you eat, it it doesn't even satisfy the hunger. You put a coat on and you 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 can't even get warm. What's wrong? What's going on? Well, then the Lord explains it really clearly that this isn't by accident. This is his loving discipline. Look at verse 9 and 11 to 11 with me. He says, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Who did? God did. You worked really hard, and you brought it home, but God said, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. He goes on, verse 10, Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew. The earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and on all their labors. What's the Lord saying? He's saying you didn't prioritize my ministry. You didn't prioritize my house. You didn't prioritize the house of worship. So I leaned in with loving discipline. This is so important for us to understand that when God disciplines us, it's an expression of his love. It's like this love-hate relationship with discipline, right? Because it's it's painful, but it's an expression of God's love. Consider this verse in the book of uh, Hebrews. Uh, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Now, it would have been so easy for God to just write his people off, right? Like all the things that God had done for them. He had brought them up out of, out of Egypt, 
freed them from slavery. He's now freed them from Babylonian captivity. All the amazing things that God had done for them, and now they're prioritizing their, their own house. It would have been easy for him to write them off, but he draws in with his love. He leans in with his love, and it takes the form of, of discipline. <laughs> Has anybody been paying attention to your investments lately? <laughs> no, don't do that. You know, don't do that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not submitting to you today that if your investments are tanking, that it's the discipline of the Lord. But I am submitting to you today that it could be. It could be. He, what does he say here? He says, he says, you work hard to get your money. Anybody working hard? You work hard to get your money, and you bring it home, and you put it in a bag. You save it to keep it, to keep it. And it's in a bag with holes. You, you ever feel like you're working harder than ever, and you can't get ahead? Like, could it Could it be? Hey, what's interesting here is, like, God's people didn't seem to be aware that, that, that the drought was God's discipline. Haggai had to bring it to their attention. Hey, this isn't just by chance, but this is an expression of God's love because he knows what's best for you and he wants to get your attention. God disciplined his people for their wrong priorities. So church, when I look at, when I look at what's happened collectively, I think, man, real life has prioritized God in an amazing way and, and in his mission, in his church, but I want to ask you the question, have you individually prioritized? In other words, does the mission of God, does the church of God, does it come first? How do you know if something's a priority? Well, you don't say things like, well, if we have enough left. Or we'll see what we have. Or we'll see how this goes. No, when we prioritize, we say, God, you're getting this first. Um, what, what I love about this whole scene is that God gave his people a chance to correct their wrong priority. I love this about God. Look, look in verse 7 with me. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's what we're doing today. We're considering our ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. So here he is. He's like, hey, you haven't prioritized, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to prioritize. Go. Go to the, go to the hills. Get the wood. Come and build my house. Um, I, uh, I, I want to I just share a conversation that I had recently um, with some real lifers who have had their lives transformed by, by God here at Real Life and to, to hear their thoughts on our time. So watch this, watch this video with me. I don't know how we missed it for so many years and we're missing out. I didn't know what I didn't know. Somewhere in my Christian household and attending church, I had missed the point. Freddie T challenged everybody in the congregation to start reading the Bible daily. As a lifelong Christian, it was not a part of my life at all, sitting down and reading the Bible. God came at me and just touched me and made me feel um, alive with the scripture. It's become the cornerstone of our daily lives. It made us talk about God more. It, we started talking to our children more with God. It just became a live, real thing that we could feel in our home. It didn't take very long uh, of me reading scripture on a daily basis where I realized, oh, Christians are baptized. Baptism was just fundamental, and I had fundamentally missed it. And, and that was a moment where I thought, ooh, there it is. Like, uh-oh. The idea came to be baptized, and it was like, yes, I cannot wait to run to that tank and be baptized. I didn't have to bring something to the table to be qualified to be baptized, to be a Christian. Like so many things about the church, it's, it just feels very real. Well, it's a, this, conversation. It, this is the first time I feel like I have a real family with this church. I'm 
so excited to, to talk about it, to be a part of it, to see it grow, to have my kids talk about it. I just see that our time is a, um, it's, it's a very real time period that sets the stage for so many people to come to know Jesus. I, it was always, everything seemed like a, a private thing. My, my parents would give, but it never was an open discussion on how we should yeah. give. How much should we give? What does God say? Are there ground rules? Is there a way to do this right? Are we, is there a way to do this wrong? I've never had a church point to it and say, here are the different ways that you can give. It was, it was just always a, oh, here's something we don't want to talk about. It's happening. We need a place to be. It's God's doing his work. It's time to have doors to open. It's not going to be about the building, but it it, um, it sets the stage for generations of people now to come, but so many more over time that I, I know people are hungry for it. And it's, it's, a, it's a real opportunity to provide for the Lord to spread the word, to bring people to Him. I think it's being done in a way that is very open and inviting and, and not intimidating for people to grow their faith by having the opportunity to give. It's exciting to think that creating a building is gonna spread His word and His work. I can do a building. And God's gonna, God's gonna do His work. Doesn't that just fire you up? Here's this, here's this couple that stepped into our church, and their whole relationship with God has been renewed. They've stepped into baptism, they're reading God's Word, and they're at this place where they, they say, it's exciting to give. I'm praying that that's our heart, too. I, I love their questions. Is, is there a right way to give? Is there a wrong way to give? Is it, you know, I want to I I give you a little bit of a giving journey here, all right? Um, most of us start with this question what do I do with my stuff? And that's a good question to start with, maybe. What do I do with my stuff? It's considering my ways, right? It's, it's not just being flippant. What do I do with my stuff? But as we, as we enter into a relationship with God, we realize, oh, it's not my stuff. It's his stuff. So then, the, so then we really begin to ask the question, what do we do with God's stuff? What do we do with God's stuff? But the longer we walk with the Lord, what we realize is we're not just saying, what do we do with God's stuff? But what do I do with what God has given me? In, in other words, we recognize, okay, it's not my stuff, it's God's stuff, but it's not just God's stuff, it's what God has given to me. So, so what do I do with what God has given to me? But as we continue to grow, we realize well, it's just not a conversation I'm having in my head. What do I do with what God has given to me? But, but rather, what does God want me to give from what he has provided. In, in other words, it's not just a conversation I'm having with myself. It's not just a conversation I'm having with my spouse. It's a conversation that we're having with God. God, what do you want me to give with what you have provided to me? Do you see how this, this grows? And maybe you can kind of find where you are on, on the journey, and maybe today or maybe over the next few weeks, you'll take a step on your journey where your whole perspective of generosity begins to change. Well, it's not my stuff, it's God's stuff. But it's, it's not just God's stuff, it's what God has given to me. And it's, it's not just for me to consider, what do I give with what God's given to me? It's, it's, it's for me to have a conversation with God. God, what do, you want, what do you want me to give with what you've entrusted to me? And, and then as we really press into a relationship with the Lord, we begin to ask this question, what does God want me to keep from what he has provided. So, so it's, not, it's no longer what am I going to give, but God touches us with his love, and God touches us with his generosity, and he changes us to becoming such a generous person that generosity is the default. So it's no longer what am I going to give. It's, it's like, no, I'm giving. Like, my life is pouring out generosity. What am I going to 
what am I going to keep? Um, we, um, we, you may want to just like grab your phone and take a picture of this so you can take it home and pray over this and consider this. Go ahead and take your phone out. Just snap a picture of this. Um, when we were leading up to launch our time, we had these vision events at Carmel Elementary School. And as I'm sharing passionate vision, um, up goes this hand from this uh, kid, like I think middle schooler. And, and it was like kind of one of these moments where like I'm sharing and up goes this hand and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> you know? do, like I have no idea what the kid's going to say. So do I give him the floor right now? Because this could go left, you know, like really quickly, you know, what's he going to? And, um, and I said, I said, Michael, you have a question? And he said, He said, can kids participate? Mm. Can, can kids can kids fill out a card and make a commitment to the Lord? <laughs> I had no idea what he was going to ask. I was like, Michael, yes, yes, yes. Michael, we want every middle schooler and every child and every teenager and every college student and every single adult and every young married couple. We want every newlywed. We want every middle-aged couple. We want every, every person just trying to find their way. We want every senior adult. We want every widow. We want everybody to hear from the Lord and to invest and to prioritize I was so awesome, and I told him this story about my son, Elliot. Um, Elliot's in eighth grade now, and, but when Elliot was just a little kid in our church in Arizona, that we, we passed the plate in that church. Maybe you've been a part of a church where they, they pass the plate during the offering rather than you know, putting it in a box. And here came, the, here came the plate, and Elliot took this wad of cash out of his pocket and put it in the, put it in the plate, and there goes the plate down the aisle. And we're like, whoa, what was that? Because it didn't look like ones or fives or tens or twenties. And Susan leaned over and whispered, Elliot, what did, you, what did you put in there? And he said, all of it. He didn't have a job. <laughs> Grandma would send money, you know, birthday money, Christmas money. He was a saver. So there were a couple of Ben Franklins. I can't remember the total amount. But he gave it all. Um, I hope Susan's grandmother's not watching today because she heard the story about uh, uh, that I'm telling you. And, um, and she wrote Elliot a note and said, um, Elliot, I heard about you giving all of your money to the Lord, and I'm so proud of you. But I want you to know the Lord only requires 10%. And so, like, she, like, sent more money to him, you know, like, because she was just so moved by his generosity. And I don't really know how this went down, but Susan, like, read the note before giving it to Elliot, and I just said, sweetie, we can't give that to him. Susan rewrote the note. Sorry, Gran. Susan rewrote the note and said, I'm so glad that you gave Jesus your all. I'm so proud of you for giving your all. Because we didn't want to stifle in the heart of our son this impulse to prioritize the work of God by giving his all. We didn't want to limit him to 10%. We didn't want to say, hey, there needs to be a lid on what you give to the Lord. We wanted to fan into flame that heart that said, I gave it all. In church, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Because I know the Lord wants all of us to take a step to trust him in a way that we've never trusted him before. I love you. I'm praying for you. I can't wait to see how he speaks to you and how he moves on your heart. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your extravagant love that you've poured out on us through your son, Jesus. Father, we just confess we prioritize so many other things at times than you, but we, we pray for your spirit's help that we might prioritize your work, your church for the glory of your name. So Lord, would you help us? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet, let's sing out.